thank you for coming tonight. This is really, this is the crappy weather month, or maybe this is after the crappy weather month, where you're not sure what's going on. It's cold, it's wet, it's raining, it's dark. And we're here, this is great. I see a sea of red, yeah. or a puddle of red. Uh, for those watching on video, and it's like a year from now, this is March 8th, 2017. Remember that? Oh God, I hope you remember that. So this is, um, this is, believe it or not, International Women's Day, with a twist. We have a bunch of movements. There's the International Women's Strike, mm -hmm. and a day without a woman. And that really made me think a bit, a day without a woman. Well, I showed up, but I had to wear. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, high drama. Uh, red socks, too. Yes. So um, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to Think about maybe the top 10 women I want to reflect on right now that are helping me with my program. So in no particular order, we have Dr. Cure. Look at that, she's wearing red. <laughs> this is from several years ago at a really great presentation on meal planning. If you want to watch it, that's in video. It's a great, uh, really good reporting. There's Carrie. Yay. No red, but Yay. oh my gosh, I just love that hat. That was a 92 degree day. I was just sweating. It was, oh, she looks so casual. I love it. <laughs> and then we have Melissa, brand new. She's an acupuncturist. Look at that red behind her. This is like, this is <laughs> not even planned. I kid you not. And then we have two folks who have departed. So on the left, Tracy, who was a previous nutritionist. Some of you may remember her. She's in sunny San Diego. And then a Catherine, oh, who just departed, moved to Ohio. Very sad. I think she'll be back someday. And of course, the Angie on the right, who has not departed. So yay, Angie. <laughs> and someone in the back is actually wearing red now, which is awesome. <laughs> Catherine, yay. Our fearless videographer, you are just rocking it. Ashley, there she is. Yeah, she's in red. She's a doll. Thank you, Ashley, for, for coming into our program and helping us behind the scenes. Deborah, most of you know Deborah. Tai Chi, she's the master, mistress, whatever. She is just divine. And then, you know, I couldn't resist. Had to pick a picture of my daughter. She'd kill me now. This is from several years ago. Actually, in a hotel room, but I just thought, isn't that beautiful? It's like, Oh, it's almost like Mary Poppins. So, so maybe you can all think for a moment as I switch over the slide deck to think about the women in your life who are around you and that you appreciate. Uh, I have the pleasure of reintroducing uh, Dr. Kelly Gupta, who is one of our psychiatrists, has a <coughs> practice as well, and gave a smashing talk last year. He's back by popular demand. And we're, yeah, by my demand. <laughs> and um, and uh, we're going to learn about maximizing willpower. That sounds like a really sexy title, but you know, there's a lot to it, and there's a lot of interesting ideas that certainly apply to what we're learning and what we're trying to do and accomplish and make for change. So, we'll give us a few moments. And what do I, I, I don't know if I have to do with this, but I'm going to do it like, is this a good place to, oh God, it's the little stuff that just kills me. We're not so good. All right, I'm not a lot of it, but that's okay. And then, I want to turn it, okay, there it's off. It's on. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yay. Good. It's really, really applicable to people who are in any kind of wellness or behavior change sort of program. And so, so I always love to be able to bring what I do over in that realm into this realm and be able to use it. So, so willpower. Willpower is an evocative word, right? It's an evocative word. So sometimes we look at willpower and think, oh God, you know. And other times we look at it and we feel empowered and. Um, the reality is, you know, in, we could all use more of it, and it's a matter of sort of figuring out how to do that, and that's what this talk is going to cover today. So um, we will move on. So, so today we're going to talk about, um, this is just a nice little overview, we're going to be talking about what is willpower? What is this thing we call willpower? We all have our own definitions, but what is it, what is it really? Um, we're going to debunk some myths around willpower, which is extremely important when we're talking about how we really can empower ourselves to act or not act. And um, catching your mind in the act. So you'll get a clue about this a little bit later on. We're going to be we're going to be under 
understanding how our mind can kind of um, deceive us and figure out ways to get around that. And um, some of the most important part is, um, and this doesn't have a, I don't need a pointer. Do I need a pointer? It's at the very tip. It's at the very tip, like this thing? Yeah. Ah, oh, thank God, okay. <laughs> it's just, I, I, just, I just get overwhelmed by the silliest things. Okay, and, uh, and then, you know, we're going to focus on practical tools for enhancing willpower, which is probably what y'all are most excited about, but it absolutely ties in with all the rest of this. Now, here's the thing. All of this, everything has a basis in scientific research, so everything that we are going to be talking about with respect to willpower today is well-researched, has very, very interesting studies to, um, to substantiate it. Uh, when I go off out into non-research land occasionally and do a detour like I'm known to do, I will let you know, or you'll know, because it'll be evident. But the fascinating thing about willpower is that there is a science to willpower. And most of us have never really approached it as a, as a science, as something that we kind of need to learn and understand. And, and understand based on the, the ample body of research that's been done. So, moving forward, um, so I really, really credit much of this talk to a book by Kelly McGonigal called The Willpower Instinct. Okay? If you do not have this book, if you have not read it, and you are in a wellness plan to, to, to get yourself healthier, or to move your life forward in some direction, whether it's career, whether it's health, whatever it is, get this book. If you're a living, breathing human being who is living in this culture, get this book, because much of what I have to share comes from this. Um, and I'm also going to touch on uh, some of Carol Dweck's amazing work. Her book, and it's a short, easy read called Mindset. It's a fantastic book. Uh, by the way, both of these books are are extremely readable. They are they are just enjoyable, enjoyable read, and they're they're chock full of information, but not in a didactic, overly texty way. They're meant to be user friendly, and so these are the, I would say these two books, and this is a strong statement of all in late 2015 up until now of all of the coaching self help books wellness books, all of the stuff that I have personally encountered and read in the time. These are the top two Kelly Gupta's recommendations for um, books related to self-coaching and, and wellness. Um, and then, so that's what I'm primarily going to be drawing on. And, uh, and then, of course, Kelly Gupta's personal experience. I don't know why, actually, I don't know why that's in quotes, because it's my personal experience. So, um, uh, I can't help but draw on that. So, first of all, look at that. So, your willpower challenge. So we all have our different willpower challenges, things that we struggle with, either to resist or things that we struggle to do, like exercise. My vice, okay, look at this. My absolute vice is sugar. I have had this ongoing struggle with it for years, and sometimes I do very well with it, and I'm like abstinent from desserts, and other times I slip right back into that pattern. I will tell you the good news is with the work of um, with Kelly McGonigal's stuff, it actually has helped it to get better so that when the slides happen, they're not as bad. But this is it for me. And I have to tell you a really funny story. Is that, that so I was putting together the slides this weekend with my husband, and he was like, oh, we got to get a bunch of pictures. So I'm like, well, we got to get a picture of a chocolate cake, because that's my <laughs> thing. So we look, and there are image after image after image on Google of all of these chocolate cakes. And I'm looking just like, what's the best one? And what's the most delicious one I can put on there? And I'm looking and I'm looking at this and I'm salivating and I'm thinking to myself as I'm putting together this willpower presentation, I am literally going to go and eat a bunch of sugar. And I went that night and I got cake and I ate an enormous, ridiculous amount of it. So which is so ironic, and I knew it was ironic, but I just, I couldn't not, even doing this willpower presentation, it was just completely mind-blowing. But you know, the point of this is, 
is that it's the, you know, we're all human and we all struggle with willpower challenges. And just because somebody who focuses on wellness and does coaching and blah, 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 and has these credentials, et cetera, is talking to you about willpower, writing about willpower stuff, doesn't mean that they don't have willpower challenges. So I love to share my own experience around this because I think it's really helpful. You know, we're all in this together. And, and this, this is it for me. This, especially like the added chocolate chips on it. It's just, it's, it's, it's like, it's like a, just, anyway. Next, next slide, quick. Next, yeah. yeah. All right. So, right, I was getting sucked into it. I was going to say it's like a chocolate prostitute. <laughs> but uh, I know that's a that's horrible That's a different comment. lecture, sorry. All right, right, yeah, that's a different picture. Okay, so, so let's talk about, so what comes up around willpower in, in terms of what, what gets in our way? And, and... Um, so let's see if some of these beliefs sound familiar to you around willpower. At some point, not all the time. I'm weak. I don't have any control. I just don't have any willpower. Not like those people who have that willpower and I don't have it. I just can't resist it in the moment, the cake. Um, there's no way I can get started on this thing whatever it is, a project, an exercise program, or I, or plain, I'm just lazy. Okay, so raise your hand if you cannot relate to this. That's, that's just, okay. I didn't, I, I didn't think so. If you can't relate to it, please come see me. <laughs> because you're probably a robot. <laughs> so, so these are problematic self-defeating beliefs, and, and most of us have them in some form or fashion, and I think particularly when we're working on our own wellness and in a program like this, these types of beliefs come up, particularly when we really face a challenge like the chocolate cake with me. Um, so why is it so difficult? Why is willpower such a challenge for us? Well, one of the reasons, um, there are a few reasons. And one of them is that I need a drink of water. Okay. One of the reasons, this comes from Carol Dweck's work from the book Mindset. Um, one of the reasons we struggle with willpower is that we operate out of what is called um, a fixed mindset. So Carol Dweck did some very, very interesting research. She is a psychologist, I believe, at Columbia University in New York. And what she wanted to study is she really, really wanted to figure out, okay, what is the difference between people when faced with a challenge, people who give up when they can't get it right the first time, versus people who just persist and persist and persist and persist until they reach that valued goal. Finally, after all of this research, she consolidated it very nicely into what explains this, which is that we can exist in these two mindsets. So the fixed mindset, as she defines it, is this belief that our basic abilities, our intelligence, our talents, all of these things are fixed, okay? We have a certain amount of them, and that's that. So every single time, so the worst part of this is, is that every, so all of this is intrinsic and we can't gain more. So every time we try to do something, our success or failure at doing that thing is a direct reflection on us, on our own worth, on our own intrinsic self-worth. So you can see that if that's the case, you're going to avoid things that you think you're not good at or that you can't do or you can't get right the first time and give up in frustration because they reflect on your own self-worth and self-value. And you're just stuck in a mindset where you feel like you can't grow. Now, the growth mindset is really what we're looking to shift into, okay? So this growth mindset is this belief that our, our most basic abilities that we have, um, they can be developed through dedication, through hard work, um, that our own intrinsic abilities are a starting point, but that we can grow, we can develop, we can become more intelligent, we can learn things, we can, that there are so many things that we really can do if we, if, now this is the key, through dedication and hard work. So people who live in the growth mindset aren't deterred by failures. Quote, failures. 
They're not deterred by obstacles because they know, hey, look, I probably can do this. It's just this is a learning experience and I need to figure it out. My Father is like the perfect example of someone with a growth mindset. Persist, fail, persist, fail, persist, succeed. Um, and I can go through and so many of these, these iterations of things that he's just persisted at. And so, so this was really enlightening for me because I realized when I read this how much of my life I had spent in this fixed mindset. And, um, and how incredibly liberating it was to start to shift into this growth mindset. So a growth mindset in this situation would say, you know what, the presentation, it goes how it goes, right? If it goes well, quote well, that's wonderful. If it doesn't, then it's a learning experience so I can perfect it. A fixed mindset would be this has got to go well or I'm a failure. Those are the two. You can see how it's very, very different. So she's done incredible research on this and started to implement it into the educational system with astonishing results. Um, I don't have time to get into the details, but it's mind-blowing what she's been able to do. And this is now becoming more of a mainstream thing in education, but don't get me started on education. Um, anyway, uh, other reasons why willpower is so difficult. OK, first of all, evolutionarily. Our, our, if you think about how we were 50,000 years ago, and the way, the way that, I don't even want to say culture was, life was, um, there were very few willpower challenges, actually, if you think about it. Like, you know, am I going to go out and hunt today? Well, yes, I'm going to. I'm hungry. If I don't do it, I'm going to starve, and the people in the tribe are going to kick my ass out, and I'm going to be out in the cold and die. So, bam, there's your willpower. You know, am I going to, you know, cavort with the other tribesman's wife or, you know, um, property probably at that time? Well, no, because I don't want to get kicked out of the tribe and, you know, get killed. And, and um, what about that chocolate cake? Well, for God's sake, if you find the chocolate cake, eat as much of it as you can so you can store up the calories. There weren't, our brains were not wired to have to exert as much willpower as they do now. The willpower challenges that we face now in everyday life are astonishing. And so while our brains have developed to some extent since then, particularly this, this frontal part of our brain, our prefrontal cortex, the developments in society have completely outpaced our, our own brain's ability to catch up with that. So. Um, we have too many choices now, and that taxes our willpower. So if you, this is really interesting. Um, when people were asked how many food-related choices they made in a single day, um, well, what do you think? How many food-related choices do you think you make in a single day? Fifty. Okay, so you think fifty. Okay. Um, so when they studied it, it was actually around 240. 240 food-related choices in a single day. I mean, imagine that. So we have way too many choices. Um, and finally, we don't understand how willpower works. So, oh, um, so okay, so there's the problem, right? There's the problem. We've got this mindset thing, our brains, and society, all these choices and everything. All right, so what's the solution here? Well, there are several components to the solution. First, we need to learn the basic components of willpower, which we will do momentarily. Um, second, we need to leverage this prefrontal cortex we have. So this, this, this prefrontal cortex part of our brain is the part of our brain that makes decisions, that plans, that thinks things through. And when we're, when we're talking about willpower, we need to figure out how do we actually effectively utilize that part of our brain. Um, and that means um, increasing what's called the, what Kelly McGonigal calls the pause and plan function of our brain. So we understand fight or flight. You know, when we're faced with a stress, you know, the saber-toothed tigers coming at us, right? We either fight, throw a spear, or we run like hell. Um, 
And that's wired into us. But this pause and plan is a much more deliberate thing from this part of our brain. And this is what's really involved in willpower, is the ability to pause, to step back, and really think things through in an effective way. Um, and the other part of the solution is overcoming the mind's tricks. This brain and the advancements in it, it's a wonderful thing. But you know, we, we, we can completely deceive ourselves and engage in all kinds of mental trickery so that the same part of the brain that offers us a solution can completely sabotage us at the same time. So, okay, so what is willpower? We finally get to the question, what is willpower? Well, um, willpower, and this comes out of um, Kelly's book, The Other Kelly, um, there are three components to willpower. Two of them seem very, very intuitive. So first there's my won't power, I won't power. So the won't power is, is what I won't do, what I will refrain from doing. I am not going to eat that chocolate cake. By the way, I actually have been successful for a few days, just to let you know. It's been, it's been a good, I've had a good run for a few days. Um, and so I won't, I won't eat that chocolate cake. I won't um, uh, sit on the couch and do nothing. I won't get on my iPhone and get sucked in for three hours. You know, that's our I won't power. Willpower is, is the force of activation. So I will go and exercise, right? I will get up and drive and come to this talk, which I applaud you for, that's, um, that I hope and know is going to be a helpful part of my will wellness program. So that's the, the willpower to, to actually do. Now, the secret sauce is number three, is our want power. And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but our want power is basically, why is it? Why do we want to do something or to refrain from doing something? What, what is the value of it? What really, what really gets us going about this decision that we're going to make? What's motivating it? What's driving it? What, what gets us excited about it? What is our motivation? And so we understand one and two, but a lot of times number three is deficient when we're making changes, and we need to really very deliberately incorporate that. So um, willpower, it's like a muscle. So it can be strengthened, um, which we're gonna talk about. It can also be depleted, which we'll talk about. Like any muscle, it can be strengthened or depleted. So let's first get to to, to some solution, since we've talked about all of this problematic stuff. Um, so we understand the different components of willpower. What are some very simple, maybe not easy, but simple strengtheners, actually, things that can strengthen our willpower? Number one, sleep. We are a chronically sleep deficient society. The percentage of people who are getting six hours of sleep or less a night is, I don't know what it is, but it's very high. I can't remember the number. You know, seven to eight is more average of what we need. And, and there have been ample studies of what happens when people get sleep deprived and the decisions they make and the food related choices that they make. It's, 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 the research is absolutely there. If we're not sleeping enough, our willpower is compromised, period, end of story. We sleep more, our willpower is better. So simple. This is very interesting. Um, Breathing, the way that we breathe can actually impact our willpower. So slow breathing, breathing more slowly and regularly can and, can and does enhance our willpower. So this is a really useful thing if we know we're entering a situation where maybe our willpower is going to be tested. And so by slow breathing, I mean about four to six breaths per minute. So if I inhaled for eight seconds, and then exhaled for eight seconds. That's roughly 15, 16 seconds. You do that, that's four breaths an hour. Four breaths a minute, not an hour. <laughs> I'm not a, um, a whale or something. Um, and so doing that, even for just a couple of minutes, actually will boost your willpower. 
So if you want to incorporate that and do it on a regular basis, or just when you know, you anticipate that it's going to be a day that's going to demand more willpower or a situation that's going to demand more willpower of you. So this breathing thing is really, it's very underrated. Why is that? I mean, do you have a simple explanation? Yeah. Let me, uh, this is a great time for me to have a sip of water. Thank you for the question. Um, if anyone remembers our, we probably won't, our the sixth pro, pro program lecture about four years ago, Dr. Brad Lichtenstein, or Lichtenstein, he said Dr. Brad, it's easier to say. Uh, he did a great talk on breathing, and this was a great subject. He talked about physiology. Um, so if you want to you see a great video on breathing, watch that one. Oh, great. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll check it out. Well, there are a couple of reasons, and um, one of them, which is very interesting, is that the, there's this nerve called the vagal nerve that basically runs from our brain all the way down and all the way into our organs and lungs, etc. The vagal nerve is very interesting because it sends signals down, but it also sends signals up. So when we're breathing in certain patterns, it actually helps to well, it actually conditions and affects our mind in different ways. So when we're actually breathing in a very slow pattern, it actually sends a signal up the vagal nerve to help our brain to calm down. Um, the other reason is that there's this fascinating thing called heart rate variability, which you think of that and you're like, oh my God, that's an arrhythmia. It's not that. Our heart naturally, um, when we're in a good state, physically and mentally, beats pretty much normally, but there's a little bit of variability there that's measurable. And that's a very, very good thing. And people who have this heart rate variability, a normal kind of heart rate variation in their heart rate, it's correlated strongly with increased willpower. And the slow breathing actually increases this heart rate variability. And that's directly related to one's ability to, um, to have willpower. So the answer is simple but complicated. You could do a deep dive into it, but that's, that's, my, uh, that's what I know. And then simple strengtheners, another one, and this is a big, this has a lot of leverage, is exercise. Even just a little. We see the E word and we get all freaked out about it, right? Exercise, even just a little. So <clears throat> the question is how much? Well. The answer is, or the other question is, the, the question back is, um, well, how much are you willing to do? What are you actually going to do? That's, that's how much. It could be taking a break every, you know, every hour if you're working a regular schedule for five minutes and walking around, that tallies up to about 40 minutes. But basically, it's whatever it is, whatever kind of, here's how she defines exercise, and I love this. If you're not sitting still or standing still or lying still if you're moving basically and you're not stuffing your face full of junk food that's exercise so that's exercise so actually if i just like if i paced around this whole time which i'm not going to do um, that would be exercise so even just a little exercise will will enhance and strengthen your willpower so these are ones that are kind of again it's Simple, but some of them are not easy. Sleep, sometimes we really, really have to work on a lot of different things in order to get our sleep normalized. Um, and I've saved the best for last. Meditation. <laughs> all right, we're going to have three separate slides on this one. I'm gonna, this is where I'm going to get all just hopped up, OK, and, and impassioned and, and, and a, little, a little edgy. All right, um, so why meditation? Well, meditation actually, it, it literally rewires your brain. So when they've studied people who have been meditating for a very long time, they see very clear, significant structural changes in the brain. And in that area that I was talking about, that is involved in enhancing willpower. Now here's what's very interesting, is that they've done studies and it doesn't, you don't have to meditate for 20 years to start enjoying the benefits of these actual structural changes in your brain. Um, when they looked at people who had meditated for a total, a sum total, not all in one sitting, 
a sum total of 11 hours, they were already starting to see changes in their, in their, um, in their gray matter, I think it was, in, the, in this prefrontal cortex of the brain. So it doesn't take much. And meditation really, really enhances this pause and plan kind of reflex. If you think about meditation, you're taking your, med your, your attention and consistently bringing it back away from a distraction or a temptation or something like that. It really builds that, mu that pause and plan muscle and helps to cope with distractions. Distractions are interesting. I didn't put this in as a separate slide. Um, distractions significantly compromise your willpower. So another study, they took people and people who were going grocery shopping. And some of them, they said, go ahead, you know, use your phone, do whatever you would normally do with your phone. Other people had their phones away, no distraction. Um, when people got out of the store, it was fascinating. The people who were distracted made much less healthy choices in terms of the food that they bought. Simply as a result of being distracted, it weakened their willpower. It's just, this, the, I'm telling you, the studies in her book are so fascinating. I can only, I mean, it would take me three hours to really go through all of them, and they're just delightful. So um, it helps us cope with distractions. Okay, now, now it's going to get fun. All right. But I can't. I can't meditate. I can't do it. Okay, this is, this is Swami Abedananda. He's deceased, but he lived in southern India and, uh, and was this, just this luminous human being. And so you look at him, and he's so blissful, and you look in his eyes, and they're glowing, and like, I'm not this person. I can't just sit and clear my mind. I can't do it. I'm too distracted. My mind goes all over the place. I, I have ADD. I can't do it. I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay, this is where, this is where I'm gonna, this is the massive uptick. All right, where I'm gonna get all fired up. All right. Yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. I know, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, it's bittersweet, I don't know. But, but yes, you can. I mean, cheesy grin, thumbs up, yes, you can. Okay, so, so, um, well, I'll, I'll finish with that. But here's the thing, is that, is that people have all kinds of misconceptions when they hear the word meditation about what it is supposed to be, what it's supposed to be like, right? I'm supposed to sit and clear my mind. No, you're not. Um, the goal is not a quiet mind. The goal is not a quiet mind. Good luck getting your mind to, to, to shut up. You talk to experienced meditators, monks, people who have been meditating for 20 years, and they'll tell you they have days where they sit down and their mind is all over the place. The goal is to build this muscle of attention. So the goal is basically to, to train your brain to have better attention. So here's the way it works. Like let's say you're doing a simple breath meditation and on the in breath, you're mentally saying to yourself, inhale. And on the out breath, you're mentally saying to yourself, exhale. That's a very simple one to do. Your mind drifts off, you catch it, and you bring it back. In that catching of your mind, you have strengthened the muscle of attention that allows you to pause and plan. So here's the thing I think that I've been, I've been trying to say this for so long, and Kelly McGonigal to basically just, she just put it together and said it, I think, in the best possible way. A noisy meditation is a good meditation because you're consistently, as long as you're me actually meditating, um, you're catching your mind drifting off and you're bringing it back to whatever point of focus you're on, whether it's your breath, whether it's a candle, whether it's a mantra, whatever it is, okay? And you're building your muscle that way. And so if you've drifted off for five minutes and you catch your mind, you've caught your mind. And this is not something we normally do in day-to-day -day life. So the goal is not a quiet mind. The goal, is to, the goal is to build muscle. And we do that by catching our minds in the act of drifting off and consistently bringing them back. And sometimes that's going to be a very pleasant, calm experience. And other times your mind's going to be all over the place. I've been meditating and doing this stuff for 20 years or more. And it's that way. So, so... 
I don't, if you, if you think you have a legitimate reason why you can't meditate, please come and see me afterwards because I will disabuse you of that idea. <laughs> I don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. If you can't sit because you're uncomfortable, you can do a walking meditation and count your steps. There's always a way to do it. So yes, you can. You can do it, period. If they've done studies on people who have ADD, to use that to treat their ADD, for God's sake, you can do it. <laughs> That's all. There's my rant. OK. So. Now we'll move on to just talking a bit more about, about want power. So, um, so want power, yes, I want it all and I want it now. Well, too bad. Um, <laughs> too bad, we can't have it, can we, right? Otherwise, uh, well, I could go off on that. Um, there's a lot I could go off on, um, but I already have. So, so want power, it's, it's the ability to remember in the moment what you really want, okay? This is the, this really, this is the way to think about it. In terms of willpower, this is like the engine that drives the train, is why do you want what you want? So for me, what I did when I read her book is I made a list of why do I want to be sugar free? Like what in my life is um, uh, what in my life is incompatible with eating sugar. And so I made this list, right? So emotional well-being, if I eat sugar, like my moods go all over the place and I get home and I'm just kind of, anyway, my husband's not here, which is good, but you know, I mean, he can tell. He's like, he's calm. He's like, he's like, did you have sugar today? <laughs> no, I didn't. How can you tell? No, I didn't. It's, it's hysterical. So, so, right, so I want a more stable mind. I want to have a sense of more empowerment and strength and willpower. I don't want to be bound by something. I want better health. I want a healthy weight. I want to be making better choice, dietary choices, because if I eat sugar, that means I'm not probably eating vegetables. So I made this list that I look at on a regular basis of why, why do I want this? What, why is it so important to me? Because this is what really provides us with really, really massive leverage and um, is the ability to remember what you really want. And, and, and really, I suggest, if you're wanting to change something, making a list of specifically why you want that, how it's going to affect your life, what your life is going to look like if you do that. I had a client, a coaching client, who she wanted to start an exercise program. And she has ADD. And um, I adore this woman. And so she, she, um, she had struggled over the years with maintaining or starting an exercise program, and she wanted to, but she was worried she was going to fail. And I, and I told her, and usually I don't order people around when I'm coaching them, but, um, but I said, here's my challenge to you. Don't exercise for two weeks. Instead, make a list of all of the reasons that you value exercise. And so we really focused on that for a while. And then it actually helped to propel the change because she could really realize all of the internal reasons why she wanted to do it, not just that she wanted to do it or should do it. So, so this really, really has practical applications. Um, it's, it's massive. So want power, key, massive leverage. Um, so strengthening and depleting. I just added this little slide because there was some interesting stuff here. So we can strengthen our willpower, we can deplete our willpower. So here's another interesting little research study factoid um, that you can do to enhance your willpower. So um, small acts, small deliberate acts of willpower can enhance your overall willpower. So let me give you a specific example of that. So they did a study where they took people for a week or two and they asked them to do some minor thing that involved awareness and willpower. For example, using their non-dominant -dom non hand to do certain things like brush their teeth, open the door, whatever it is. There, was, it, there were a few things they asked them to do with their non-dominant hand, which required the, the implementation of this pause and plan thing. Because they had to be thinking about, okay, 
Am I using my right hand or my left hand? So it was another way of building that muscle. So then they, at the end of the study, um, offered the control group and then the group that had used, used a small willpower challenge, some temptation, I don't know whether it was food related or whatnot, and the people who had done this small willpower challenge, actually it spilled over into other areas and they were much less likely to, let's just say, eat the piece of chocolate cake, okay? So it's really interesting, you can creatively do things to increase your willpower. For example, if you cross your legs a certain way, deciding that you're going to be aware of crossing them the other way and that you're going to deliberately do that for a week or something like some small thing like that actually enhances willpower in other areas, which is fascinating because that's another easy thing to do and kind of fun thing to do. Um, as far as weakening <clears throat> uh, willpower, so we can, we, we can weaken our willpower through overuse. We have only, like a muscle, we can only use it so much before it fatigues. And we can only use our willpower so much in any given day before it fatigues. So the more willpower choices we have, the harder it's going to be. So the easiest sort of take home point from this is, don't take on too many willpower challenges at one time. You will deplete yourself and it will not go well. Try to limit it. And, um, and try to, as I mentioned before, limit things like distractions. Limit the number of choices that you need to make in any given day, as much as you can. Um, so, so, and also blood sugar plays a role in this too. Ample studies on this too in the book. Um, when blood sugar dips, willpower <coughs> crashes. And so the more we can maintain a nice even blood sugar, uh, the better our, our willpower is. So, which is why I'm susceptible later in the day to eating sugar, because oftentimes, you know, it dips, blah, blah, blah. But this relates to any, any willpower challenge. Okay, overcoming the mind's trickery. This is fun. And I can only scrape the surface. Um, of what is in Kelly McGonigal's book in terms of the, of the various ways that, that our little brains can trick us, can trick us up. Um, so this brain can support us or it can undermine us. And there's a quote from this man that I knew back in, when I was in residency training in Dallas. His name was Charlie Brown, not the cartoon character, um, now deceased. And he said, he used to say, the mind's capacity, that our mind's capacity for self-deception is limitless. It's so creative. We can so, we're so good at this self-deception thing. But the good news is there really are only certain, you know, a few categories of ways that we can deceive ourselves. Even though within those categories there are all kinds of, we're really good at it. I'm really, really good at it. Um, so, uh, here's the biggie. This is, this is really the, the, probably the biggest one, is what's called moral licensing, or we could call it license to sin. So, if we start labeling our behaviors as good or bad, um, let's just say our health-related behaviors, for example, as good or bad. If I exercise, I'm good. If I don't, I'm bad. We start using those more kind of moralistic words to describe our behaviors, it actually sets us up for failure. Because what happens? Well, I've been really, really good for a month. I've been really good with the sugar for a month. I mean, even my husband will tell me this. He's been like, well, you've been really good. I mean, it's just like, oh, no. I've been really, really good. So what would it hurt? You know, I've been, I've been exercising for a week consistently, so you know what? I deserve that chocolate cake. I've been good, so I can be bad. So, and most of you can probably, have probably done this, and by most I mean probably all. You know, it's a fairly universal thing when we think of our behavior in these terms. So this is moral licensing. Now, how do we get around this? Um, so again, more research studies 
Um, people overestimate their ability to change their behavior tomorrow. Okay, so so people people overestimate that consistently. They think. Okay, well, you know what? I'm going to eat the chocolate cake. That you, you can morally license based on the future. You can borrow from the future. So, oh, well, I'll exercise tomorrow, and I'll be bad and eat the chocolate cake today. Well, what happens? Okay, huge percentage of the time, that exercise doesn't happen. So, assume that the future is going to be like the present. So, if I, here's the way to think about it. If I eat this cake, every single night for the next year, what's my life going to be like? How am I going to feel? You're really thinking about that. Because that's actually closer to the truth. If I make the decision to eat it today, well, the odds are pretty decent that tomorrow or the next day, I'm going to make the same decision. So if I think about it in those terms, if, 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 what if I just ate it every day for the, for the next year? Well, gosh, there'd be all kinds of consequences that I wouldn't like. Alternatively, if I don't eat this cake every night for the next year, if I abstain from it, and it gets easier over time, this is the, this is the trick, because it's true. It gets easier over time, whatever change we make, whether it's exercise, whether it's diet, whether it's meditating, whether it's whatever it is. Um, then how will I feel? What's life going to look like if I don't do it today, which means I don't do it for the next year? What's my life going to look like? Um, what, what, how's that going to affect other people in a positive way? How's it going to affect me? What's my health going to be like? What's really mapping this out? So thinking that is sort of the antidote to this moral licensing thing, is assuming if I do this, this is, this is likely to become a trend for me. And what is that going to be like in another year? That is the more rational way to think about it and a constructive way that can kind of be a deterrent. It's like, oh, OK. No, I can't just jump back on it tomorrow. I, you know, yeah, yeah. So um, how many times we've gotten sabotaged by this moral licensing? Um, here's the other thing, too. Now this, this is also fascinating. I'm just fascinated. I'm just, con con I'm just fascinated by all of this stuff. Um, so when things are going well and we're actually making positive changes, um, we naturally want to recognize that, right? And reward that. Like, well, even if we're not saying it's good or bad, we want to pat ourselves on the back and say, you know what, we're really, oh, that echoed. Um, we're really making, I, you know what, I'm making progress. This is really good, a good thing. I'm making progress. Wrong. OK, that is the wrong way to do it. And it's not, I'm not sitting here moralizing. It's just, again, the studies have shown that if we think of things in terms of progress, we're much more likely to give in to that moral license and give in to temptation. I'm making progress. Well, I'm making progress, so a little backslide is not a problem. But of course we want to recognize and applaud ourselves for the actions that we're doing. So how's, what's, the, what's the best way to do it? It's to link progress with values. So this is really what it sounds like. You know, it is really, really wonderful. I'm so delighted and I'm so pleased and I'm so proud that I haven't had that chocolate cake in a week because this is why it's important to me because I remember that not doing that helps me to maintain a healthy weight because not doing that um, helps me to be emotionally stable because not doing that helps me not to be chained to this addictive pattern. And I'm so pleased that I'm making this change because, and then linking it to your want power. Now that, when people do that, they're actually, they're actually less likely to then give in to temptation when faced with it. Very, very interesting stuff. How many times am I going to say fascinating and interesting? I don't know. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, oh, please, yeah. jump in. Yeah, feel free. So, OK, I'm going to tell you what my argument against this is so you can help me out with that. Oh, okay. good. Okay. So when we got to this part of if I eat this cake every night for the next year, how will I? Assuming that I'm going to eat this cake tonight. Mm -hmm. OK, so I suffer a lot from catastrophizing. 
So that, my first thought was, well, wait, if I have a cake tonight and assume I'm going to never have it ever, that sounds like a catastrophizing to me, which mm. is probably not what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So that's my argument. It's, it's not what I'm saying. So, so let me ask you. So if you had, is cake like a thing for you? Meaning, it, it, it is something that that you would potentially eat in excess and want to eat less of. More like something like potato chips, maybe. But more like potato chips. Okay. So, so yeah, that would be. So I'm thinking of I'm thinking of something like um, an indulgence that I would regularly give into that is going to sabotage me and set me back. So for so for 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 a lot of people, it's like. Having a piece of cake is no big deal. You have a piece of cake, and then you can take it or leave it and not have it for two weeks. But what I'm talking about are really those kinds of, those more repetitive, self-defeating sorts of things. Not like every time you, I mean, you know, you could get mired in that if you thought about everything that way. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, some kind of habit you're really having trouble breaking. Exactly, yeah. right. The stuff that we're really having trouble with. It's, it's useful to think of it in those terms. But God, no, not everything. Oh my God, are you kidding me? No. And then that's all. catastrophizing about this. I mean, then that's all we'd be doing is thinking about, well, what happens if I take this next step for the next year? I mean, it'd be paralyzing. So, no, it's the problematic things. And I'm really glad you asked that question because it's important to distinguish that. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. You bet, yeah, and chime in if you have questions, and I'll have time for questions at the end, of course. Um, so, this is, this is now, now we're launching a little bit at the interface of Kelly McGonagall Land and Kelly Gupta Land, okay? So here we go. So, this is, um, so do you really want what you think you want? This is a really good question. So, Think about the experience of desire. And I don't just mean the desire of like, oh, I'm at a restaurant and sure, I'd like a glass of water. The desire, the desire for, to, the desire to just sit on the couch or the desire to have that piece of cake. I keep going back to the cake because it's just such a great example for me. Or chips, you know. Um, the desire, the desire either to avoid something or the desire to get something. Desire is actually a very uncomfortable experience. If you tune into it and notice it the next time, when you have a craving or a desire, it's really uncomfortable. You're thinking about the thing you want, your body's getting all tensed up. It's what you want is relief from the desire. So we often really just want to relieve the desire. We don't even necessarily want the thing we want. I mean, it's a little bit of a, you have to kind of think about this one. But, but, but one way to be mindful of this and to study this, when you're having it, that desire, that kind of binding desire, is to notice, when I then indulge in that, do I really enjoy it as much as I think as I enjoy it? Or is it that it's sort of, oh, quenching that desire that I have, that unpleasant feeling. Am I really just trying to get rid of an unpleasant feeling, bottom line? And um, so this is, um, this is James uh, Swartz. He's a, a, a spiritual teacher. I spent some time with him down in, in a town called Southern India, a town called Tiruvannamala in Southern India in January. And um, I, love, I love what, this is a quote I wrote in my little book as I was there. And I pulled it out for this. Um, and this is totally in Kelly Gupta land. OK, so, um, so I love what he said. If it was so good the first time, right? If it was so good the first time, if I thought it was going to complete me, it was going to do the trick, this chocolate cake is going to fix me, it's going to feel good, it's going to feel wonderful, why are you doing it again? Like, why do I need it, this thing again? If I thought I was going to get this thing and be happy, well, here I am again doing the same thing. It obviously hasn't done the job. So this is stuff to kind of ponder off in the, the interface of Kelly, Kelly, Kelly land, the two Kellys. Um, so, but desire is painful. So how do we then when faced with this unpleasant sort of sensation of desire or craving, what's the best way for us to handle it? 
Well, most of us want to suppress things. We have unpleasant feelings. We want them gone. We want to get rid of them. How do I get rid of this? This is so unpleasant. I got to get right. I can't stand this. I got to get up. You know, you, we go to all these efforts to try to suppress. Well, guess what? That requires a lot of work, and it sets us up for willpower failures. Prove it. So, um, so there are other ways to approach this, uh, these cravings. And, and this is where uh, mindfulness and meditation can really come in handy. And so what we really, a really useful way to do it is to be like an investigator, to be a scientist, or even to almost pretend like you are this, this alien from another planet that's been dumped into this body and mind, and you're just sort of observing and studying <coughs> what's going on. So to notice the, the feeling of craving, kind of just dispassionately, like, oh, there's this churning in my stomach, and I know I can see my head sort of spinning with all these images of meat stuffing my face with cake, and, you know, I feel it in my whatever it goes on and on, and just like, just noticing it and sort of studying it, and even articulating it out loud can be a very, very helpful thing. Um, there's a nice way of describing it, which is called <coughs> urge surfing, which I really like that term for it. Now, this is this is um, this guy in Hawaii. I saw this on one of those animal shows, like People and Their Animals, that I love to watch when you know things in the world get me depressed and I just want to look at animals. Um, so, so this man, he has a pet pig, and he goes surfing with his pig. He lives in Hawaii. It is the coolest thing. It is so cute. So, um, so I put this up there for urge surfing. He is definitely surfing, and this pig like balances on the board. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. I just I love this pig. So, so urge surfing. You can just urge surfing is kind of cool because it involves all of the the components that I just described about sort of observing and um, just observing and noticing what's going on with you. But urge surfing is almost empowering. It's like, you know what? I feel this craving coming on, and you know, I'm going to pick up my surfboard. I'm going to get on this wave that's just cruising through, because that's what desire is. It's a wave. It comes up, it peaks, it subsides. And I'm just going to get on this board and ride this wave and not let myself <coughs> crash under it and just ride it until it subsides. And, and thinking of it in those terms, it's, it almost, you can bring a little bit of fun and creativity into the process of, of, of just tolerating an <coughs> urge or desire. So, summary, in summary today, um, so we talked about the components, basic components of willpower. I, you know, our won't power, our will power, and our want power. Um, we've described, um, I've described, uh, how willpower is like a muscle, the different ways we can build it, and all of the factors in this world that potentially deplete it. And then we've talked just about some simple tools to enhance willpower. I've given you just some of the basics. There's a lot more in the book. Um, and understanding and overcoming the mind's trickery, the way that it tricks us in various ways. And one thing I didn't write here is I would just really encourage you to consider and think about willpower to sort of step into it from the perspective of a growth mindset. That you don't have this fixed amount of willpower that you can't change. That when you're in a growth mindset, and, and this actually reflects reality, that you have the capacity to build <coughs> greater willpower in healthy ways that aren't self-punishing, and, and that this is something that we can all expand on. We just need to understand how all of this works, and we haven't had the understanding and the training to understand how it works in this society where we have all of these choices. And so be nice to yourselves. Live in a growth mindset with this stuff. And um, with that, I will move on to any um, questions or just even comments or thoughts that come up for you. Yeah? I've got a, a good resource to start giving <coughs> meditation. 
That's a great question. Um, oh my gosh, there, there are so many. Gosh, where's my, where's my smart phrase when I need it on my, on my, uh, on my computer upstairs? Um, there are, oh gosh, like the, the, in Seattle, I know there is, you know, this is, this is just terrible. I thought somebody might answer, ask me this question, and I'm, I'm coming completely empty handed. You know, in Seattle, there are a lot of resources. What I would say is the very easiest way to actually do it is to, to look up on YouTube, just look up, you know, mindfulness meditation or guided meditation. I just encourage people to look on the internet and, um, and find, look up, you know, mindfulness meditation, breathing meditation, and then you can have a guide that can take you yeah. through it. You don't even have to leave your own home. Um, I use um, Headspace. Oh, Headspace, yes. Yeah, and then there's another one that's from Rick. What oh. I like about it is that it just tells you to, to try to observe what's going on. It doesn't say fix this, fix that. It's that one that just says look at it, and that's it. And it's an app, right? Yes. Yeah, right. Headspace is the one I've heard of. I haven't yeah. investigated it yet, but now, now I, I must. Now I must. Yeah. Yeah. So, if I have you know, all these things that were advised to do, Yeah. I have to start getting ready for bed at 7 o'clock. <laughs> right, in order to get ready for bed. In order to get even six hours to sleep. Okay. So, that's right. with your example, um, why do you want that? So Six hours to sleep? Well, well, why do you want to go to bed early so you can read extra time and then lights off at the right time? Do you want that because we should do it? Or do you want that because you know you want more sleep because it makes you feel better and so on and so forth? Why, maybe why do you want that? Is right, that sure, yeah, like what's the want power behind getting, say, I don't know what op what amount of optimal sleep would be for you, whatever it is, eight hours or whatnot. More, <laughs> more right, than what I right, yeah, so, so what's the want power behind that? Why, you know, why do you want it? How's it going to make you feel? What's it going to do for you? What do you value about it? And, and thinking about that, yeah, I think that's... Then I have to give up something else. Indeed. <laughs> yep, I know. We went back to the slide. I want it, you know. I want it all, and I, I want, want it now. I want to meditate. I want to pray. I want to do my gratitude list. I want to do, you know. Sure. Well, yeah, and it and it may mean it may mean modifying some of that stuff, or doing it for shorter periods of time, or you know, adjusting it. You just have it's it's. I mean, this is one of the things I work with in people in in coaching is just is doing these minor tweaks here and there or sort of seeing things from a slightly different perspective, you can, I mean, you can, this is a very modifiable issue. Like, I, it, this is the kind of thing I hear and I think, you can find a way to strike a balance and do enough of the things that you value, but it, it sounds like it will involve some sacrifice at least of time, but it's about figuring out what, what do I want the most? What's most important to me? Yeah, prioritizing, and why? And just sort of reflecting on that, and that helps to guide what you do. Yeah, and that's why sleep, sleep. I don't actually like to sleep. Yeah. And so that's why it becomes mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, oh listen, I'm not great about it. I'm working on it too. What I did, I had to implement the, and and, and I don't do this perfectly, but the, the, the power down, the cell phone, okay, so I don't get sucked in, <clears throat> literally put it in another room and don't look at it until I have already done my whole morning like ritual and then and only then turn it on. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but, but it really is about, it's about just, just that want power of prioritizing what you really <clears throat> do want. And, and maybe, in terms of the sleep, because that can be kind of silent, the, the consequences of it is starting to identify, well, what, what happens when I don't sleep well? What are, what are the actual consequences of that? And really making note of that. Because I think so many of us run around sleep deprived and we don't pause to say, okay, what, what's going on here? You know, like, what, what is the cost of this to me? 
I know I certainly don't. You know, I've not been the best at the sleep thing, and I'm better, thankfully. But so, so those are just some ideas. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to chime in for a moment. So some of you might have to leave, but um, thank you for coming tonight. And if you want to stay uh, a little bit and answer some more questions. Yeah, I'll stay. Yeah, and if you want to, at some point, I'm going to boot up uh, like a newsletter. I don't know when. Non-intrusive, maybe once a month. If you're interested in getting it, I just put a little sheet there. So if you want to leave your name and email address, and you know, and then I'll sell it. And that's what I'm actually, That's what it's actually for. Is uh, is for me to sell your information. And, you know. Nice try. I gotta Thank get you so done. Much. Thank you. Uh, 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 pleasure.